The Renaissance astronomer Nikolaus Copernicus once said, for it is the duty of an astronomer to compose the history of the celestial motions through careful and expert study. Copernicus was a man who challenged the theories of the universe known to humanity up until the 16th century. His observations led to the discovery that the planets revolve around the sun, not the earth as people thought. Indeed, our celestial objects have been observed and studied since the beginning of time. The planets and stars have helped us understand the cosmos, the way it functions, and its impact on our lives. Then, in the 17th century, Galileo Galilei became the first astronomer to use a telescope for his observations. The rest is cosmic history. Today, there's one question that most people want answered. Is there extraterrestrial life? I'm Lucia Newman in one of Chile's many observatories in the Atacama Desert. If the question of extraterrestrial intelligence is ever to be answered, it is likely to come from here. These exceptionally blue skies and the extremely dry atmosphere make this the ideal location for building the world's largest telescopes. In fact, Chile will soon house 70% of global astronomical infrastructure. Even NASA comes right here to test its robots. But what will all these new facilities help us to discover? And how will they change the way that we look at our universe? Two of Chile's top astronomers, Maria Teresa Ruiz and José Massa Sancho, talk to Al Jazeera. Dr. Maria Teresa Ruiz is known for discovering the brown dwarf star system named Kelu-1, a substar located in constellation Hydra, approximately 61 light years away from Earth. On our planet, she's a pioneer the first woman to have received a doctorate from Princeton University, the first woman to receive Chile's National Prize for Exact Sciences, and at present, the director for the Center of Excellence in Astrophysics. Dr. Maria Teresa Ruiz, thank you so much for talking to Al Jazeera. Very soon, Chile will house the world's two largest telescopes, the ELT and the giant Magellan, which would provide, I understand, direct views of planets in other solar systems, which would be uh, an, an astronomical first. How close will that take us to answering the question that everybody wants the answer to? And that is, are we alone or aren't we? We know there are many planets because we see the effect of the planet on the star they are orbiting. But to see the planet is very difficult because the star is so much brighter. You know, we, we cannot really see life in, in these planets, but we could see in the, their atmospheres and see if there is oxygen, for example. Oxygen was produced by life in, in, on Earth. And so we hope to study the atmospheres of these this extra exoplanets to see if they, they may harbor life. When you see the universe through these big eyes, you are going to see something nobody else has seen before. And although you have to justify all the, the, the funds to produce, to build these instruments. Yes, they're a billion dollars each. Billion, yeah, exactly. You say it's just to, to study exoplanets, to look at the beginnings of the universe. But often the case is that what you see, the unknown, is the most interesting thing. Something you cannot predict, you know, because it's like opening a window to the unknown. Well, there is a theory, in fact, that life on Earth began when meteorites or other bodies crashed onto our planet with very, very small uh, creatures or, uh, or multi-cell <laughs> yeah. beings, and that from there, animals, plants evolved, and that would mean, and that if they came perhaps from Mars, we could be actually, Martians. Uh, we could be Martians. <laughs> <laughs> how, how feasible is that? Life is, is, is there potentially, and when it, in the whole universe, and when it arrives in a, in a place where, you know, it's comfortable and it can be developed, it does. You know? So it would not be something particular of Earth or Mars or, you know, it could be everywhere in the universe. And in some 
places it can prosper, in others cannot. But although we have no evidence, I would find very extremely strange <laughs> that we were would be the only ones in the universe. You know, it's, there are so many, so many stars, so many planets around them. You know, uh, I'm sure there could be life in many of them. What inspired you to choose a career looking at the, at the stars, at the sky? Actually, it was a love, of, love at first sight, you know, <laughs> something like that, because I never thought about becoming an astronomer. Although I, I did always liked science and was very curious. So I look around and, and uh, discover there was a pra summer practice in Tololo, which is the, uh. the Inter-American Observatory. And I went there, I didn't know anything. I didn't, never looked at the sky, I don't know why. I went with a colleague, a student, who he knew everything, you know, and, and he was really mad at me because I couldn't recognize Sirius or or any of the big stars, important stars in the sky. And in the middle of the night, he said, okay, go out and try to, with a map of the sky, and try to find some of the constellations. So I went out, I didn't look at the map. I just put my eyes. It was a dark night with no moon, no moon. And when you are in a clear place in a mountain, you see the horizon below you. And, and I could see the Milky Way on top of my head that were like surrounding me. Uh, at that point I had a little bit of knowledge of about what the Milky Way was and where we were in the sun, uh, uh, orbiting the sun. And I realized we, I didn't know anything about this, you know. And, and I realized I was part of, a, of this galaxy, of this universe. And I wanted to know more, you know. And, and I said, okay, if my talents are enough, I will put all my energy, which I think is more important than talent, uh, to try to become an astronomer. Well, you are certainly an inspiration to women in, in this country and I think to uh, astronomers or future astronomers the world over. But how difficult was it uh, when you started out to be taken seriously in a field that is still dominated by men? Yeah, I think the the, the the most difficult part, maybe, was in the U.S. when I tried to be included in the groups to, 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 to do homework or to work on a project really? together at Princeton. And I realized that I was the first woman to be accepted as a graduate student there. So I was a really strange beast, you know, women and Latin, you know, I, probably the poor guys were afraid of me. I could see that they would get together and work on homework or projects, and I was never included. At the beginning, I thought because I was not as good as they were, they all came from big universities, and or because my English was really bad. But in the second year, my English was had improved. And um, I was doing well in a couple of the courses. I, I was probably doing better than the rest, or at least as, as well as they, they were doing. And um, they gave us very hard uh, homework to do. But I was so used to, to working by myself that I, you know, I had done this homework by myself. I went through the office of one of the guys there. I realized they were trying to solve the problem in the blackboard. I realized they were not starting well. I mean, these are problems that when you don't start the well, right you can never get to the right answer. So I, I, I came in and said, oh, this is my opportunity. So I started to say, oh, no, you know, you, you have to change these variables and do this. And, and then I looked back, and they had left. No. And I was there alone. And, and people say, oh, you were sad. No, 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 no I, I wasn't sad. I was really happy. Because then I realized it was not my problem. It's not because I didn't speak English or because I was bad in, in, you know, in science. It was their problem. They didn't know how to work with the women. It was okay to go for pizza, for beer, or for playing sports. 
but not for working together. And then I realized many times women, we believe we are a little bit guilty of what is happening, or maybe when we are discriminated, we think maybe there is some good reason for, for that, you know, in, in, the, in the background, you, you, you think maybe, maybe they are right, you know, maybe I'm not good enough, or maybe I've done something wrong. So it's, 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 it, it well, taught me a lesson, you know, that one should not think that way. You know, when I see women now uh, marching on the streets and reclaiming the, their rights, I am very happy because I think, you know, I could not have done it, but it is time for, for them to. You told me a, a little while ago that you were interested in writing a book about the sun, that the sun has been kind of left aside because it's so close to the planet Earth. And, and you talked about the Carrington event, which I found fascinating. And you say that the sun has an agenda, so we really cannot ignore it anymore. Tell me a little bit more about that and, and, and exactly what are the dangers of all this? There was this British astronomer who was observing the sun every day and he projected the sun in a screen and, and, and make pictures of uh, drawings of the, the, the sunspots, these black spots that are in the surface of the sun, which is where the magnetic field comes out. And uh, there were big ones. And then he saw a flash of light where these dark spots. He just wrote that and made a picture. The, year, uh, the day after that, uh, uh, the, the communications in, in, in the whole world were perturbed. The telegraphic stations were on fire and they didn't know what was going on. There are records that people in Havana were, were seeing the um, northern lights, the auroras. Yeah. The, the whole sky was uh, bright with light due to the, these charged particles that had seen this Carrington astronomer in, in, in Britain uh, had you know, travel all the way to the Earth and, uh, and produce this effect. And what would happen if that happened today? When today we depend on, on, never, on, of course, on computers and... If, if an event, ejection like the Carrington event happened today, GPS will die. You know, all the GPS, the, the, all the planes that now are traveling, flying through these uh, automatic pilots, and they will be completely blind trains, you know, transport, all the, com uh, the communication system, all the, the, the electricity, they all be fried. Aside from all the, the, the damage that can produce something like that, you know, that you, we are left without any of the technology we know now, we use now. So I say we depend a lot of what the sun does, more, much more than the people think. Uh, eventually it will kill us, but uh, in, in short time, maybe today or tomorrow, it can really make a lot of damage. And the only, we have, a, like earthquake, we can do, cannot do anything but, except to know more, to learn more, to, to, to understand how, is this happen, how this happens and try to prepare a strategy so that we can survive it. The speed of scientific and technological breakthroughs is making ideas that were once limited to science fiction now seem, if not within reach, at least plausible. One of these is the possibility of landing and even colonizing planet Mars. Chilean astrophysicist Jose Massa is one of the boldest exponents of this and many other extraordinary theories. Where to begin? I, I think I'm going to start with Mars. In your okay. book, Mars, The Next Frontier, you argue that uh, we have to turn into a, a multi-planetary society as soon as possible mm -hmm. in order to guarantee the survival of our species. Uh, what is the hurry? Uh, don't we have another uh, billion years left before the sun destroys planet Earth? What I'm, uh, I argue in my book is that the next challenge the next intellectual challenge is to go to Mars, not to save the species. But why do you want to send them to Mars? Just for curiosity? Well, because it is or... possible. Because it is possible. When we went to the moon, all technology got an improvement enormous. Our life, your, mine, and everybody's life changed forever because of the dream to go to the moon. The only way to survive in Mars is to have another technology. 
And if we develop the technology that for a few of us to live in Mars, that technology is going, is going to change our life on Earth forever. What about oxygen? What about water? The atmosphere is completely different from ours. Well, it's a big challenge. But if we are able to develop the atmosphere in Mars, we will be able to clean our atmosphere. But if we develop big machines like that to survive in Mars, those machines applied massively on Earth, we could be taken out of the atmosphere as much carbon dioxide as we are putting in mm. with automobiles, with the airplanes, and with and your rockets. <laughs> and even with the rockets. And then the technology, uh, uh, to me, the human being, if we are not willing to accept challenges and to move a little bit out of our comfort zone, we could be still in the cave. We, we could be a few living in a cave, but human beings who got out of the cave and started cities and started all this civilization because every time was taking a new challenge. And the next challenge, the challenge today, is to go to Mars. There seems to be a growing tendency, or there is a growing tendency in the world, as you know, to negate science. It includes heads of state who say that there's no such thing as climate change, a whole series, uh, uh, this tendency now to say that what the scientists are saying is not true. If this is the case, uh, we may never make it to another planet because of this planet may perhaps, according to many, not survive long enough. I think that people today are living so fast that they don't have time to think. Because if you are using a cell phone, you cannot negate science. Because the cell phone contains millions of hours of work of thousands of people that have been working for you to have the cell phone in your hand. And when you dial or when you uh, send a message or when you uh, use internet in your cell phone, there are thousands of people in this network. And all that is finally tuned into the Maxwell's laws, all the laws of the electricity. Galileo was experimenting how, was, how a stone fall to the Earth. Kepler was studying how the planets revolve around the Sun. And Newton was thinking how could be reconciled the motions of the Moon around the Earth with the following uh, objects. Uh, and he developed the laws of, uh, of mechanics. And then everywhere you have science in your life. You have said, and that was, this is one of the, I found this very interesting, that the moon is getting further and further away from Earth. Uh -huh. And I'm wondering what impact will that have on Earth? With a with trip to the moon, with Apollo 11, they left there an artifact that allows to measure with a laser beam mm -hmm. the distance to the moon with a precision better than one centimeter. And the moon is receding two, two and a half centimeters per year. Since the time when uh, Angstrom and Aldrin uh, stepped uh, their foot on, on the moon, the moon now is at least a meter farther away. And the moon will keep receding from the Earth. And in the, in the, in 100 or 200 million years, since the moon, if its object is, uh, is shrinking, is getting uh, smaller and smaller. And at the moment, the moon is going to be uh, smaller than the sun forever. And then the eclipses will not be here forever. Sun, sun eclipses will not be able to be produced because the moon will be uh, smaller than the sun. When the moon and the earth are facing each other, 
the rotation of the moon is of the order of a month around the earth and then the rotation of the earth is going to be a month and then we will see the sun rising and it will take seven or eight days to get to the meridian the day when the sun is up is going to be 15 days and then for 15 days you will have night okay. and then the climate on earth is going to be very different well that of course um, would seem to emphasize the need to uh, have what you say a multi-planetary system sooner rather yeah. than later well, but I can't end this without asking you the question yeah. that everyone uh -huh. has asked him or herself some, at some point and that is do you as a scientist believe that there is intelligent life outside of the planet earth uh, yes I do we live in a galaxy the Milky Way that contains 200 billion stars if life was developed on earth and if that process is very unlikely maybe one every million times you will produce life and but all the stars in the Milky Way all the stars have planets and they probably there, there were or there are of the order of 200 billion possibilities of developing life in a planet mm. Is this the only planet that contains life in the whole galaxy? If so, if you have just one planet with life, and I'm not talking about human beings, on Earth there are 8 million forms of life on Earth. Most of them are bacteria, but a bacteria is a form of life. If we are the only planet in this galaxy with a space telescope, we can see 100 billion galaxies. Maybe there is one planet with life per galaxy. <laughs> My suspicion is that at the very least, there are 100 billion places in the universe with life. But from one galaxy to the next, a big galaxy like, like the Andromeda galaxy, the distance is more than two million light years. Mm -hmm. If you say, hello, are you there? In two million years, your message, it, it will reach Andromeda. <laughs> and if they, they, they say, yeah, we're here, what, what do you want? Another two million years to, to, for the message to return. And then even communicating by radio or by phone or by WhatsApp with a civilization in Andromeda, it's almost impossible. Now? Now. But, but if Einstein, for the, one less, for the last 100 years, people have tried to prove his wrong, and so far no one has succeeded. And mm -hmm. Einstein said that nothing can travel faster than light. Today, if we want to visit the closest uh, neighbor, Alpha Centauri, is four light years away. With the technology that we have now, it will take us 40,000 years to go there and another 40,000 years to come back. Yeah, you can say, okay, the technology can be improved by a factor of 10, okay, then it's going to take only 4,000 years to go to Alpha Sam. Even at a very, very close, a, velo a velocity very close to the speed of light, it will take at least 10 or 20 years to go and 10 or 20 years to come back. And that is the closest star. And even discovering planets that could be habitable in the future, well, how are you going to move 20 billion people to a planet that is uh, uh, 50 light years away? It's a dream. Yeah, the human beings, we are confined to the solar system forever. I don't believe that we could ever uh, colonize. The, in the same way that I, I'm absolutely a believer that we have to go to Mars, I don't believe that we could ever go to, to visit or to colonize a planet of another star. 
I bet in a hundred years there are going to be people that don't agree with you. <laughs> well, yeah, if they prove me wrong, I'll be happy to prove them wrong. <laughs> to be proven wrong. Yeah. Professor Jose Massa, thank you so much. It's been a privilege talking to yeah, you. Yeah, it was a pleasure for me to talk to you. Thank you.